allow me to tell you my story. Arundel. It was the seat of my earldom when I lived. Situated in the South Downs in West Sussex, England. was built in 1068, while William the Conqueror reigned our lands. From 1138, the earldom passed almost directly through the generations of my ancestors, reaching me during a turbulent time. My mother, Mary Fitzalan, daughter of the 19th Earl, married my father, Thomas Howard, Duke of Norfolk, passing the earldom to him. She was only 17 when I was born, and she died not long after. When I was born, His Catholic Majesty King Philip of Spain and England was my godfather, and Queen Mary was present at my Catholic baptism. I was heir to the highest position in the land after the throne. My father married again, but when my stepmother died, he married for the third time to Elizabeth Dacre, thus becoming the richest man in England. My father bought the Charter House in London, home of the great Carthusian martyrs, which he renamed Howard House. There I spent most of my childhood. Perhaps the prayers of these holy men followed me, the eyes watched over me, for the world about me was soon to change. In order for my father to keep his wealth, he married my brother and I to our stepsisters. Anne was my bride, and we married when I was 14 years old. Born into high society and position, England in the 16th century was glorious to me, and the attractions of the world were alluring. My heart desired them, and I enjoyed the presence and company of the royal court from my birth. Queen Elizabeth soon succeeded Mary and installed the Protestant Church as the official religion in England. My father easily adopted the new religion and obeyed. When my stepmother Elizabeth lay dying and begged for a Catholic priest, he dutifully denied her that comfort, faithful to the Queen. My wife's grandmother, however, was adamant in teaching us the Catholic faith while she cared for us at Howard House. Anne's heart was drawn to the truth and gradually was torn between her love for me and her grandmother. She refused to have anything to do with the state church, even though to be a Catholic was punishable by a most gruesome death, hanged, drawn and quartered in public. and prayed for me as my journey took a different path. My father soon made an enemy of Queen Elizabeth, who determined his death upon believing that he was planning to marry Mary, Queen of Scots, and reinstall Catholicism in England. From the dreaded Tower of London, my father wrote to me, He urged me to serve and fear God above all things, but I was too enamoured of the society into which I had been born. When my father was executed, I left for Cambridge to study and enjoy life, leaving Anne and her prayers behind.
the lure of pleasure. My wealth, my talents and my social status all drew upon me flatterers and admirers in the freedom of university life. Although I was worldly, ambitious, seduced by entertainments, socializing and possessions, I was being drawn to Catholicism in my studies. My tutor was the great scholar and translator of the Dowie Bible, Gregory Martin, friend of Edmund Campion. Intellectually, I was drawn to the faith, but love of worldly things held me back. I was soon presented at court, and all loved me, including the Queen. I groveled to the woman that had murdered my father. Desperate to please Her Majesty, I spent my inheritance extravagantly, all the while ignoring and neglecting Anne, who resided with my grandfather, the Earl of Arundel. When my grandfather died, all my worldly ambitions fell at my feet. I became Premier Earl, the most powerful man after the throne, and was accepted into the House of Lords. Within time, my duties at the House of Lords led me home, and eventually I was reconciled with Anne, and indeed became devoted to her. I had everything I had ever wanted, but my heart was dissatisfied. Suddenly everything was destined to change when I heard a great defender of the Catholic Church speak and defend the Catholic faith. Present at the disputations of Edmund Campion in the Tower, what had drawn my mind intellectually to the Catholic faith now captured my heart. I had been convinced that the Catholic Church was the true faith over the years, but the day that I had heard the convicted Catholic Jesuit Edmund Campion speak, I was profoundly moved. Edmund Campion had been denied opportunity to prepare his debate and had been severely racked. Thus weakened, he stood through the four long conferences without chair, table or notes and stood undefeated. All my pleasure seeking, my worldly desires and ambitions were shown to me to be worthless and useless. I stood at a crossroads of two lives and God was asking me to make a choice. How alike I was to Augustine, I could not tear myself away. Campion's words hounded me amidst the entertainments and pleasures at court. I left, returning to Arundel, where our Lord pursued me there. Few men came so reluctantly to religion as me. I knew that my conversion would be punishable by death and that once fully reconciled to the Catholic Church, it would be impossible to hide the zeal and fervor for the truth that consumed me. I knew also that my social position would not save me. Anne was expecting our first child, and since Anne had embraced the Catholic faith, Elizabeth had placed her under house arrest for refusing to attend Protestant services. The Queen was adamant that our daughter would be christened Protestant and named after Her Majesty. 
Amidst these turmoils and dangers, I gave up my struggle between the world and God and chose my eternal salvation. As I paced the long gallery in Arundel Castle, my long mental struggle was finally resolved. I left Arundel and returned to London, where I was reconciled to the Catholic Church under a devout Jesuit priest. In embracing the church, I embraced God's Catholic people, and it was not without some reluctance that I soon found myself the leader of the Catholic laity in persecuted England. This was no light conversion, but a complete change of life for me. I sheltered a Catholic priest at Howard House, from whom I could frequently receive the sacraments, and prayer became a regular part of my life. But as Premier Earl, my duties to the Queen meant attending a Protestant service, which I knew I could not do. My various pretexts for not attending could not last. I was anxious of how I could best serve the Catholic laity in England, and I wrote to Cardinal Allen in Dowie, the leader of the Catholic community in exile. But my letter was intercepted. A fictitious reply urged me to leave England. I would leave my beloved country, Anne, our daughter, and our unborn second child, by sail at Littlehampton. Once at sea, my ship was intercepted, and I was captured and taken to the tower. the dreaded Tower of London, my home for the next 11 years. Stunned but resolved, I embraced my prison. This was our Lord's will for me. I accepted my part in his mystical body and offered him all that I was to suffer. A year after my arrest, I was committed to the tower at the Queen's pleasure. Elizabeth thought I would give my life on the scaffold impulsively, so she decided to break me with a long ordeal. If I did not break, she knew that imprisonment and confinement after a wealthy and favoured life would be worse to me than death. But our Lord helped me. Deprived though I was of the Mass and the sacraments, I developed a prayer life within my prison. I set out strict time for the breviary, psalms, aspirations, and beads. Our Lord favoured me with spiritual assistance too. Before his own martyrdom, Father Robert Southwell wrote to me via his acquaintance with Anne. In his letters he gave me encouragement and guidance. Though we never met, when he himself was committed to the tower before his own brutal torture and execution for the Catholic faith, my dog visited his cell and how much more I loved my dog for it. England was in a time of turmoil and cruel persecution of her ancient Catholic heritage. The bloodthirsty reaction toward the Catholic faith after the threat of the Spanish Armada resulted in many Catholic deaths and soon Elizabeth's eyes turned to me. My trial approached. I was charged with praying for the success of the Spanish Armada, the only case in English legal history where someone has been condemned a traitor for prayer. This I denied, saying I had offered prayers for the safety of Catholics during the crisis. But I was found guilty of treason 
and sentenced to a traitor's death to be hanged, drawn and quartered as Edmund Campion and Robert Southwell before me. I lived in the tower, ever ready to give my life for the Catholic faith in England. My days were spent in prayer and rigorous fasting. The people were repulsed at my condemnation, so Elizabeth did not sign my death warrant, but I was not informed and lingered in the tower under constant threat of death. The weeks drew into months, the months into years, the crown of martyrdom took on a more somber form, the silent, slow death of the passing hours, years and failing health. I was ill, slowly dying, deprived of Anne and my children. When I saw the light of eternity drawing near, I requested of Elizabeth that I might see my family one last time. Elizabeth's message was firm. If I would but once go to their Protestant church, not only would she grant me my request, but she would restore all my estates and honours with as much favour as she could possibly show. Here was my final choice. It was Elizabeth's revenge and my last sacrifice. But I saw everything in the light of eternity. The thirty-eight years of my mortal life played before my mind. Two ways, two choices. My story began in Arundel, seat of my earldom dukedom and everything the world could offer me, but finishes in the Tower of London. It was not the end, of course. Philip died on Sunday, 19th of October, 1595. His body was laid with his father's until 1624, when it was moved to Arundel. Anne died at the age of 73, after a life spent serving the Catholics of England. Anne and Philip were buried side by side in the Fitzalan Chapel of Arundel Castle. Although Philip had not died on the scaffold, his long, slow martyr's death in his cell in the Tower of London for the Catholic faith caused his name to be regarded with great honour among the laity in England and abroad. He was proclaimed a saint and canonised in 1970. In 1971, his mortal remains were transferred to a shrine in Arundel Cathedral that was built by his descendants. Philip lived in England during an age of affluence and prosperity, and like so many, became wholly absorbed in the attractions of this world. England today is suffering through a time of rationalism, secularism, and a great undermining of the Catholic faith and morals. Many lessons can be learned from Philip's life, but an important part shines out for us all. 
During his time of suffering in the tower, he derived his strength from his faithfulness to prayer, spiritual guidance through reading, and frequenting the sacraments. England is a country of great Catholic heritage and her children would do well to imitate this great hero of our land.